We are in, I think, our fifth uh, on a series of gospel conversations. Uh, the fifth message in this, and this is a departure from our Second Corinthians uh, study. We left off in Second Corinthians chapter seven, uh, going into chapter eight. But we've taken a time out here, and I'm going to be again intentional about why we've taken the time out. We've taken the time out because there are a lot of new people at fellowship. And there is a disposition that we want to have here of speaking about Jesus, of being disciple makers, and reorienting ourselves to what that means. And I want to remind you that doing the work of the ministry is far less complicated than we often make it. Um, Being a disciple of Jesus is far less complicated than we often make it. And I will tell you that it's possible for people to be in church all their lives and really not grasp the concepts that God has given in disciple making. I can tell you, I, I can tell you this is true, not because pastors are necessarily special, but I know that Monty was just with a group of pastors and talking to those gentlemen about disciple making and internships and doing the work of the ministry. And I will just say on my part, whether it's with pastors or uh, lay people looking to get involved in ministry, when we talk about discipleship, often uh, the way we approach discipleship we hope is biblical but it's surprising to me how many times when we have that conversation it's like a light is coming on for the first time and it doesn't have to be that way it, uh, you know we the bible does give a path to know what being a disciple of christ looks like and in that we want to make sure that our church knows that part of discipleship here is that we are speaking about jesus amongst each other uh we are blessed to be at a place. I think, do you guys, did you guys know this valley is growing? <laughs> did you know that? Did it surprise anybody? <laughs> okay. So we have a unique circumstance at fellowship, and I don't think we're alone amongst the churches here in the valley, uh, but many churches are experiencing an uptick of attendance, and there may be a whole host of reasons behind that, but God has I think, blessed by putting us here at this time and place in history. And I can tell you that there are many churches that find it rare to have a visitor in their service all year long. And I think that's, uh, I think that's a hard thing to work with. And sometimes that's very regional, uh, very isolated kind of ministries kind of thing. But we have the blessing of having a lot of people here each Sunday. And I just think that we ought to be talking about Christ before, in the middle, and after the service. And it's really my hope that in those conversations that you would might, may be able to even lead somebody to the Lord or be of spiritual encouragement or a blessing, building and edifying to one another. We want from the beginning to the end to be pointing to Jesus Christ. All right, so as we, as we come back to uh, how we got here, I wanted to have this conversation with our church family so that we can know that we should be speaking Jesus, whether it's here or out of here. But knowing that we have a lot of new people coming, I wanted to have a time where we're really focused on talking about the gospel. And so some of that is for the church family. We walked through a series of S's about speaking Jesus. And the first one of those was that, speaking. And we looked at similar verses to this. But Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 is Paul's prayer. He says uh, a verse back to this, pray for me. But he says in verse 19 of Ephesians 6, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Just last week or two weeks ago, had one of your young teenagers came up to me right of service right over here where Pastor Phil's sitting and said, Pastor, I just want to let you know I got to speak Jesus to somebody, told me how that went and praise God for it. That's what needs to happen. And I think that testimony needs to be shared amongst our church family. And it isn't... Uh, you know, a little notch on our belt. Hey, I got to do it. You didn't. It's, we all need to get better about speaking Jesus. Okay. So speaking has to happen. We have to open our mouths and Paul prays for boldness that that would happen. We talked about spirit leading, that we need to follow the spirits leading. We looked at a couple different illustrations in that uh, realm, but I want to remind you that you really never make a cold turkey call. 
I mentioned that last week, and, and I've got no qualms with door-to-door evangelism. I don't put that down. I think, I think any way in which we give the gospel is great. But I want you to know you're not making a cold turkey call because the Holy Spirit is in the world. In John chapter 16, uh, verse 8, he's in the world. He is reproving the world. He is uh, reproving the world in sin and in righteousness and in judgment. He's working in the world actively that way today. But we need to find a way to follow the Holy Spirit's leading in who we speak to and when we speak. We also looked largely at Acts chapter 17. There needs to be a speaking, a spirit leading, and there needs to be a searching Uh, And the idea of searching is getting to know the people that you're trying to give the gospel to. Now, again, I don't think it has to happen one way or the other. Uh, There's been pendulum swings in Christianity of our methodologies. I don't I don't really argue about methodology. I think we just need to get it done. Let's talk about Jesus one way or another. But one thing that happens when we talk about Jesus, we need to talk about Jesus in the spirit of searching. Daniel, we talked about this this week, the importance of asking questions. As we ask questions, we listen to where people are spiritually. This is what uh, Paul did at Areopagus. This is where he sees the the altar to the unknown God. He makes, makes a lot of observations. But in that, he is searching for where they are. And in his observations, we looked at these observations that he made in the searching for where these people were spiritually. They made this altar to the unknown, unknown God. They were spiritually minded. They knew there was a God. They knew uh, there was a need for appeasement because they had done something wrong in their hearts and minds to offend that God, and they needed to be right. And they took measures to be right in the method that they knew by making an altar. All those things became tools whereby Paul could speak to them, speak to their spiritual need. So my point is, I gave some methodologies last time on how to ask questions. And I want to say this one more time before we really get into uh, the message this morning. Asking questions is important because you need to find where that person is spiritually. The hard thing about preaching to this congregation this morning is that every one of you is at some different place with your walk with God and your questions. And I'm, I'm doing it some broad platform, okay? But I think asking people where they believe they're going to go when they die is a great question. And then asking them why they believe they're going to go to that place when they die or what they think about that. Uh, Asking them and listening to their answer and then saying that answer back to them to say as if, did I get this right? Gives them an opportunity to tell you where they are and gives you an understanding to speak to them appropriately with doctrine. So my point is, the illustration I made is, when I began giving the gospel, I was more worried about getting through the Romans road and getting it all out there. And that's what I felt, I felt like was success if I got to give the whole gospel message. But I'll remind you, the Spurgeon said that he often didn't lead people to the Lord until his third visit. Took three times for him to walk people through their questions and answer their questions to lead them. That's what a disciple does, leads people to follow Jesus. So to do that, we need to ask questions, find out where they are, be a good listener. And then from there, we dealt with sharing the gospel. We asked this question, what do people really need to do to be saved? You remember last week I said there's a short answer to that. The short answer is in Acts chapter 16 and verse 31 where the the jailer, where Paul's in jail and there's an earthquake and the jailer jumps in and he's afraid the prisoners have left and he's about ready to kill himself. Paul says, don't do that. And he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They give a short answer. Now, I believe behind that short answer, and the reason he even asked that question is that he was hearing the message from Paul in prison. So there was doctrine, I think, already laid down. But he asked the question, what must I do to be saved? In Acts 16, 31, you know the verse. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. We're going to hopefully talk about that today. I hope we'll get in John chapter 3, but I'm not committing to it. So here's what we're doing now. We're going to talk, walk through quickly what we talked about last week on what do people need to know. And this depends, again, on the conversation. 
Some people are raised in church, some people are not. I'm starting from a point where people aren't raised in church, don't know a lot about the Lord. Pastor Phil and I sitting on an airplane talking to a lady next to us from this valley who really doesn't know about Jesus at all. We're not talking about a third world country. We're not talking about someplace else that doesn't have Bibles everywhere. We're talking about right here from this valley. So the mission field is right where we are. What do people need to know to be saved? Well, I start with two kinds of revelation, general revelation and special revelation. General revelation, last week, Romans chapter 1. And by the way, if you're taking notes, which I'd encourage you, I, I'm, not, I'm not noteworthy, but the, the Bible is, okay? So if you don't know this, Romans 1 is a great passage to go to every time when you're trying to speak to the fact that the world knows there is a God. And how do they know that? Because God has revealed that in creation all around you. And I don't know if you're familiar with the John 10, 10 project. I don't know tons about it, but I know that everything I've seen so far has been good. I'd encourage you to take a look at it because they bring creation to bear and just keep magnifying God through what he's revealed in creation around us. And is God's hand, hand evident in the world around you? Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to shove that knowledge away to believe something else. And God says that's exactly what people who are lost do. And so they're held accountable because they know through general revelation that there is a God. It's what led these people in Acts chapter 17 to building an altar to this God they did not know because they knew there was a God. They didn't know who he was or how to respond to him, but they knew there was a God. Special revelation, again last week, there are three main points in special revelation I gave. And I understand this may take you more time to get there. This may not be where you would start in your beginning of talking about Jesus. But I want you to know that the special revelation God has given outside of general is that God has given revelation of himself through the person of Jesus Christ. Christ, I, I love speaking to people who aren't saved about who Jesus is and there's nobody on the planet that's ever been here that's like Jesus. And we talked about passages along those lines. I won't go into those again, but also the miracles that Jesus did were special revelation to prove who he is. And then also uh, we talked about the Bible being the special revelation that God has given. And let me just give a summary of the Bible. The Bible is the account of the Savior that would come, did come, and is coming again. The Bible is the account that a Savior uh, would come, did come, and is coming again. So the Bible is written by a whole lot of different people that God led to give the story of the Savior's coming. So from the Old Testament in prophecy to the New Testament and the works of Jesus, the coming of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus, and the coming again of Jesus, all those magnify that there's a Savior that the world needs to know. All right, so the special revelation tells about God. Now you might say, well, what if somebody uh, bucks at the idea of uh, general revelation or special revelation? That is really a response of the heart, and you don't need to sweat it. You don't need to sweat what people do with your message because it's not your message. You're simply an ambassador. You're telling what God said. Believe the power of the word of God, amen? So when you're talking to somebody who's not saved, you, by the way, I, I don't have to tell people I'm quoting verses when I talk to them. But I do. I don't have to tell them uh, even, even very, I don't have to even get the verse, uh, every, you know, if it says Seth and I say, say, they don't have to, they don't have to know. I'm just telling them the truth of God's word. Don't stress what people do in their response to it. Just give it. So God gave general revelation, special revelation. And back in our Acts chapter 17 passage and visitors, I know I haven't really make, made you dive into scriptures yet. This is a whole review, okay? But they knew they were accountable to him. Now, are we accountable to God? How do we know that? Well, you know it by revelation and by faith. Do you know any verses that says we're accountable to God? There's a lot, right? One that we often use is Hebrews chapter 9, 27. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So will people be held accountable to God or not? What if I don't believe? 
Are they held accountable to God or not? So I just remind us, some of you have been pulled over by policemen before. <laughs> some of you should have been put, pulled over by policemen before. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I have no idea where this was pointed. It's just... I'm feeling it. Okay. No, it's not one of those churches either. Sorry, not one of those. The policeman doesn't say that your ignorance gets you out of it. And what we know is that the world is not ignorant. Romans 1. The world is not ignorant about the existence of God and accountability to him. People may deny it, but it does not make the truth go away. The last thing we said before we come into this morning is that there is a savior. There is a rescuer. This was the angelic announcement of Christ that a savior was given. And we need to be rescued. Plenty of scriptures that we can go to. We talked about death last week. Talked about the Romans road last week. And there is a way to be saved. There is a way to come to that savior. And I told you today that we would talk largely about repentance. So what must a person do to be saved? What must a person do to be saved? I'm going to say it this way. And I already know that when I say it, it's loaded. But you must, you hear me, you must repent and believe. The story is told of a young man named John who received a parrot as a birthday gift. The parrot had a bad attitude and even a worse vocabulary. Every word out of the bird's mouth was rude, obnoxious, and unsanctified. John tried and tried to get that bird's attitude adjusted by consistently saying only polite and nice things to the bird, playing soft music to the bird, trying to clean up this bird's attitude and vocabulary. Well, finally, John was fed up after months and months of trying he yelled at the parrot, and the parrot yelled back. John shook the parrot, and the parrot only got more angry and rude. John, in desperation, not knowing what else to do, takes the parrot in his hands. He grabs the bird, and he throws the bird in the freezer. For a few minutes, the parrot could be heard in muffled squawking and kicking and screeching. Then suddenly there was, finally, total quiet. Not a peep was heard for over a minute. John, fearing that he had gone too far and hurt the bird, quickly opens the door to the freezer. The parrot, still alive, actually calmly steps out into John's outstretched arms and said, quoting the parrot, I believe I may have offended you. <laughs> With my rude language and actions, I'm sincerely remorseful for my inappropriate transgressions, and I fully intend to do everything I can to correct my rude and unforgivable behavior. Quite a mouthful for a parrot. John was stunned at the change in the bird's attitude. As he was about to ask the parrot what had made such a dramatic change in repentance in this parrot's behavior, the parrot continued, may I ask, what did the turkey do?
So repentance is a change of mind. And we're going to talk about that for a moment. But repentance is timely because repentance cannot come when it is finally too late. So we need to talk about repent and believe for a moment. So I want you to know that I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about repentance. But I want to give you 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. So I hope you'll take your Bibles there. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Let's read this verse together. I already can tell you we're probably not going to get to John 3. You can blame the parrot story. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. In John, or excuse me, 2 Peter 3, verse 9, we read, and I'll just have you read it out loud with me. 2 Peter 3, 9, would you read with me? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many does the Lord want to come to repentance? Yeah. All. So it is God's desire that all people be saved. Now, theologically, we're not going to get too far into this, but I think I want to acknowledge this and say this. Okay, there is, it is true that there are a couple passages that speak to repentance being given as a gift. And there are those in different doctrinal sets that will say um, that you can't repent unless God gives you the gift of repentance. I'm going to tell you, I don't think you really need to get lost in the weeds on that. Here's why. God has called everyone everywhere to repent. And I believe that if God's calling you to do that, then he's given you the moral uh, ability and the moral decision to make that choice. We'll talk about that here in just a moment. But the point is that this repentance that is spoken of needs to be understood more clearly than it often is today. Would you look at least at Acts chapter 3 and verse 19? These are just two verses. And as you're turning there, I'm going to try to be a little more clear about what I just said. Um, there are those then that would say, and I think box the topic of repentance into the framework of you can't repent unless God gives you the gift of repentance. And I would say that if you're going to argue that position, you're really missing the boat on repentance. The idea is that God wants everybody to repent and everybody theologically should agree with that. If you don't agree with that, you have to get scissors out and cut out these verses and deny them. And that would be inappropriate for any Bible believer. But in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, do you have that one? Let's uh, read that one out loud together. Acts 3, verse 19, we'll read the whole verse. Ready? Read with me now. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So we have in these two verses, at least, there are many others we could go to, that speak to the idea that we need to repent. In this one, repent and be converted. But what is repentance? What is repentance? And I want to challenge you with something. And I, all right, now we're friends here, okay? Let's be friends, and I'll give you some homework, okay? Here's the homework. You do a search anywhere in your Bible and you tell me where you find the verse, repent of your sins. So you look for it. and I'm going to tell you why I'm making that point. Now, my intent here is not to attack, but to clarify. Some of you are familiar with Ray Comfort and there's a lot of really good gospel work that Ray Comfort does. And my goal here this morning is not to beat up Ray Comfort, but Ray, in some of his videos, does a poor job at describing what repentance is because he qualifies repentance as repent of your sins and turn to Jesus. And he will go on to say, you need to stop sinning and come to Jesus. 
and it's theologically getting the cart before the horse. And I love the work that he does. He does one of the best jobs of any believer that I know of laying out the case of how we've broken the law in our sinfulness and that we are accountable to God because of our sin. So, and do I believe that Ray's a brother? I, it grieves me that there are now videos out there that they're going to say that, you know, Ray's not saved and, you know, uh, I'm just not going down that path. I'm just saying, let's be careful. And I think the reason this matters is that if you give people the gospel with the idea that they're going to stop sinning at the front of it, then what are they going to do a week later when they realize they're still a sinner? Now, I know there's a whole epistle of James and in every bit of that's the word of God and true. But we have to keep the order correct and we have to understand what repentance is. So too often repentance has this idea. Repentance means that I'm going to commit to stop sinning. Now, there is room for some of that, especially in the life of the believer. But let's talk about it for a moment. So repentance in the Old Testament has a flavor of breath. And it has somewhat the sense and gives the sense of a, a sigh of sorrow in your breath. So it's true as far as the Old Testament is concerned that the word repentance has this flavor of sorrow with it. But that's not the nature of Montaneo in the New Testament, the Greek word used for repentance Looking at Thayer or Strong's, really Thayer says it pretty well, but repentance is a change of mind. It means to make a decision to think differently. That's what the word means. And you've often heard, and I'm not, I'm not throwing stones at this either, repentance is, is going one way and doing what? Doing a 180 and going the other direction. Well, we'll talk about that in just a moment, but I want to ask you something. Is it possible to be sorry and not repent? Yes. Right. So it's possible to be sorry for something, but not to really repent of it. Take, take any addiction that you want to take. You can be sorry for its consequences. You can be sorry for what it's doing to your life and still not make the decision to quit. Right? So if you persist, you have not repented. You may be sorry, but your persistence shows a lack of a change of mind. So you can imagine the conversation of a husband and wife driving down the road, and they're supposed to be going someplace, has an address, and the wife is hearing the GPS go off and say, uh, in the lady's voice, turn right here. And the wife hears that, and the husband ignores it, and drives fast, and the wife says, you just missed your turn. And what does he say? Well, he either says, no, I didn't, or he says, I know. <laughs> now, the wife is faced with an incredible dilemma. How... How in the world do I reconcile his knowledge with stupidity? <laughs> None of you have ever persisted in your knowledge when you knew you were wrong to the point where it could be called stubbornness. But this is the definition of repentance. Repentance is knowing but then acting upon that knowledge where there is a change. Where there is finally a change of direction, a change of disposition, a change in course of action. Does it involve sorrow? And here's one of the problems with repentance. Is sorrow truly a part of repentance? Well, I would argue, yes, it is. But when you make sorrow your litmus test, 
You never know whether you've been sorry enough by the measure of sorrow. I've seen people cry and not repent. I've seen people um, know that they were doing wrong, know the truth, and persist still to their own detriment and grieve over it and wag their heads and wonder of how can this be this way? And it's very, very simple. You're prone to hear me say often, it's not rocket science. Repentance is simply making a decision to where you will finally act upon a change of mind. How do you know if you're really sorry enough when it comes to being saved? You need to be sorry enough to yield in your heart and mind. You need to be sorry enough to change your mind and turn in faith to Jesus Christ. So this is repentance. It is having a change of mind, both about my sin and about Jesus. So let's go to John chapter 3. Now, this is not the John 3 section I was going to be sharing with you. But in John chapter 3, we're going to pick up in verse 19. John 3, 19. Would you read this verse out loud with me? When you're there, I hear pages turning. Good for you. Give it a second. All right, before I get there, here we go. Let's just talk, and I'm talking broadly to the body. I have no idea where everybody is in your knowledge of Christ and salvation, but here's what the Bible's going to say. The Bible says, John 14, 6, most of the church family knows this and should be able to quote it with me, whereas Jesus says, what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. God's people, do you believe that? Jesus says that. Now, to the invitation to everybody in this room, this is the truth of what Jesus has said. He has said that he's the way to salvation. He's the way to life. He is the only way. The Bible also reflects that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. It is through Jesus and Jesus alone. There are a lot of people that will say that they believe that, but when you ask the question, what are you trusting in, they have Jesus and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I'm just going to tell you straight up, that's not what salvation is. Salvation is in Christ, and how do we say it? In Christ and Christ alone. So someone could say, oh, I hear that. Well, well, I've already done that. No, you haven't if you're trusting in Christ and all these other things. There has to be a change of mind in the sufficiency of Christ and accepting the offer of Christ and Christ alone. And an issue of turning from what you were trusting to turning to faith in Christ and Christ alone. But when it regards the lost, in John 3, 19, you hear this. And this is the condemnation. Read it with me. Read verse 19 with me. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Let's go ahead and read verse 20 as well. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So here's, here's the point. We can be sorry because of our sin, but you know repentance has happened when you have a change of mind from verse 19. It's when you say, I am making a decision that now I know, according to God, that my sin is not okay. Okay. And this is where sorrow, and if you want to talk about, and that's why I'm saying this even now, some of our tracks don't say this well, and I don't like it. But it's also why I'm talking to you about this now. We need to explain what repentance is. And there's room to say that we repent of our sins. But this is how you repent of your sins. My sin is not okay. It's not okay for me to persist in in loving my sin and thinking my sin has no condemnation. 
It's not okay to say in my life, you know what, my sin doesn't matter. The condemnation is that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So God will judge through his spirit and is convicting the world even now of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. There's coming a day where every knee is going to bow before the sovereign king of kings. And no matter how much we persisted in saying, my sin is okay, the judge of all will declare that sin not to be okay. And those consequences will fall on everyone who made the decision to not repent and come to Christ. That day's coming. And repentance is offered now for anyone who will make the decision to react upon the truth that you've been given. And I think what we do is we make this a position of will. This isn't me trying to beat you up to tell you the truth. This is me lovingly bringing you to an accountability to the truth and saying as sure as we're sitting in this room, as sure as we're experiencing the temperature, the lights, and expression of this room, there's going to be a reality of standing before God. And at that point, it will be too late. According to the word of God. So now is the time to change your mind about Jesus. Now is the time to change your mind about your sin being okay and it's no big deal. It is enough to take you straight to hell. (coughs) So how do you know? <clears throat> this is one of the things that I think most people struggle with, with repentance. We have a bad definition, a bad working definition of what repentance is. <clears throat> Excuse me. And because we have that bad working definition, we don't know whether we've done it or not. There are some people here who were saved when you were young, and yet you struggle And you wonder, did I really mean it? And did I do enough? Was I sorry enough? I'm trying to drink a cough away. (coughs) Was I sorry enough? Here's how you know if you're sorry enough. When you make a decision to turn and place your faith in Christ and Christ alone. You've not repented if you haven't done that. Hear me? This isn't me being mean, bad, or ugly. I'm telling you the truth in love. You have not repented. Enough. If you've not made a decision to act upon what you know and to turn and bow your knee and place your faith in the sovereign God of all, the person, the Lord, Jesus Christ. Unless you do that, you've not repented. That's the standard of repentance that God gives. It's God's will that everybody comes to that. You see, the change of mind leads to a change of behavior. In other words, repentance leads to making a decision. So what decision are you making about Jesus? So I want to be really clear about this again. We're going to talk about this, hopefully, in two weeks. Next week, I already have where I want us to be, and it's going to be a repentance kind of message. So I already have where we're going to be next Sunday for Resurrection Sunday. We'll come back to John chapter 3 and have a gospel conversation about John chapter 3. But I'm going to take you back to the offering plate. And if you weren't here for this, simply it's this. I ask people often, what is in their plate that they're offering for the reason that they are saved? And I quite literally do this. I pull out whatever's in my wallet and I put names behind them. Some people, I believe in God. Some people, I've not done any major sin. And let's combine it, I've been kind of a a decent person, a good person. 
It might be I was baptized. It might be I was raised in church. It might be my family was saved. It might be I've been around all that stuff all my life. And then also I I know about Jesus and I, I believe that Jesus is the Savior. We put all these things together. And the question is, if you're to ask God, why should I be in heaven? And we offer him this. This is not what salvation is. Salvation, I'm not sure if it's sanctified to use a credit card. I'm not sure if it's sanctified to use a Costco card, but here we go. It's, <laughs> where's a Costco card? It's putting one thing in the plate. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. And if you've been believing something different than that, change your mind. Change your mind based on truth, based on what God has said. Reject what you were trusting in and believe in what Jesus says. So let me tell you what I often find. When you deal with that offering plate like that, this is what it looks like. Very often people have this invisible scale. And they think in this invisible scale that somehow added to this, my good things are going to outweigh my bad things. And maybe if I just have just enough on this side, I'll get to heaven. So you know what I do? I ask people that question. In your mind, is there a spiritual scale? In your mind, do your good things help you get to heaven and your bad things keep you from heaven? And I listen to their answer. I let them tell me what good things help you, what bad things hurt you, and I listen to their answer. And when people have their good things on the platter, what are they trusting in? A little louder, please. Works. Well, what's the problem with works? We quoted it last week. Let's do it now. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, if you know it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves... It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So there is no spiritual scale. It's either Jesus or nothing. And I call you by the authority of the word of God, if you have not believed or changed your mind about that truth, repent and believe. Change your mind about your doctrine and receive the salvation that God gives in the way that God gives it through Christ and Christ alone. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus did it all. We didn't even talk about believing today, but here's what repentance and believing do together. When true repentance happens, a decision is made. You make a decision to change what you were believing in to believe something else. And God has not made it a secret. The the New Testament regarded the gospel as a mystery that is no longer a mystery. The path of salvation has been clearly declared by Christ The way to be redeemed has been given and it's been offered for everyone in this room. And in this room, there's a lot of history. There could be Mormon history. There could be Catholic history. And I'm going to say something as bold as I know how to say it. You listening? I'm not, it's going to, it maybe even sounds offensive. I'm going to tell you, you cannot believe Mormon doctrine and be saved. You cannot believe Catholic doctrine and be saved. Now, you may be Catholic in your upbringing. And do I believe that there are Catholics who are saved? Yes, I do. Do I believe that there are Mormons who are saved? Yes, I do. But if they're saved, they do not believe the doctrine of the Mormon church or the Catholic church because they teach another gospel. Is God clear about that? So, there is some point at which you recognize that preaching comes right up to somebody's face and in love tells them the truth. 
And we'll see that next week. But some of the preaching that Paul and Peter do, they don't mince words. You killed Jesus. You're the murderers of the Christ. And how good is God's offer of forgiveness? Even for those who did that, he's willing that they would come to repentance. It is the best news on the planet. So the invitation is open this morning for anyone to know Christ. Repent and believe. Now, it's really important, and I'm sorry, I know, I know that it would take another hour for us to walk through a tangible expression of what does believe mean. And I intend to do that. But not today. <laughs> Amen? Amen.